Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 19. This week, I'm pleased to bring you a conversation I had with Ken Rosenthal, who is a photographer based in Tucson, Arizona. I've been aware of Ken's work for several years now, uh, since seeing him give a lecture at the 2012 Medium Festival. The work he showed in that lecture was was like looking into a dream or inside someone else's memories. It was often they're often dark and indistinct, and it includes images that are calmly beautiful next to ones that are sort of unsettling. And um, interestingly, you know, key to his process is that it's all analog, all shot on film, uh, developed and toned by hand. Uh, the product of hours and hours spent in the darkroom. Ken is a master of, uh, of, of darkroom photography. And his early work uh, that I saw at the Medium Festival is all, is all like that. Now, last year, I had the opportunity to see a new body of Ken's work called The Forest, which is a series of nighttime landscapes in the Colville National Forest in Washington State, where Ken has a cabin that he's been visiting for his whole life. And since I first saw it, the project has matured and been released out into the world, and we talked about it for this episode. I'd like to read part of the statement for that series. While the forest is a series of landscapes made in a specific locale, the core essence of the work is neither about landscape nor the region depicted in the photographs. The landscapes function metaphorically for internal physical and psychological states. What began as an exploration of a land I was intimately familiar with ultimately came to reflect upon elements of my very being that I was less attuned to. The work is quite dark and densely layered, visually as well as in content. The images are interwoven with thoughts on mortality, discovery, loss, and renewal. That series is on his website, and I'll include a link in the show notes, though I should note that this is an instance where looking at the images on a screen really doesn't do justice to the subtlety and the lush blacks in the actual prints. Uh, finally, I was surprised and honored that Ken shared with me some work still in progress, a book he's working on called Days on the Mountain, which takes images from his personal archive of family photographs and sequences them into a powerful yet tender narrative about change, ephemerality, and mortality. I wish I could provide a link for that work so you could see it too, but unfortunately it's not available to the public just yet. So all I can say is that it really is amazing, resonant work, and I'll just encourage you to stay tuned to my and Ken's social media channels because I'll be sure to pass along any news about that project as it develops. So let's get started then. Here's my conversation with Ken Rosenthal. So how have you been? You know, uh, it's an interesting question. Been very up and down. It's, it's been a really kind of a strange year and a half or two. Mm -hmm. um, but things seem to be kind of on the up. Okay. I think just a lot of a lot of transitions in in my personal life right now. Mm -hmm. so that, that's been a challenge. It's also you know it's informing the work that I'm doing. My work's always been. Uh, you know, come from a very personal place. Yeah. So I, I think like any story, you know, I mean, I, I think photographers tend to be storytellers. I usually think of myself as a storyteller. And if there's no conflict, you know, in a script or a novel, then there's no story. And I, I think artwork functions the same way. There, there has to be some sort of an edge or conflict Mm -hmm. to, you know, as a viewer to fully engage me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. As I recall, the first time I uh, I encountered you and your work, it was at the same time. It was at the first Medium Festival. Yes. Which I believe was in 2012. Yeah, it was and, hard, it's hard to believe that they're coming up on their, I guess, fifth, fifth uh, Medium. Yeah. Um, I remember you gave, a, you gave a presentation of your work to that point. Um and I was just really taken with, with what you were presenting, um, and I think most of it, uh, it was is covered in this the this uh, sort of retrospective book that I got from you, um, mm -hmm. the two thousand one to two thousand nine photos. Um, but you know what I I've been I, I was re going over that um, that book again, going back through it, and you know sort of remembering everything. Um, 
and and what what always struck me about those photographs is how um sort of psychological they seem how um you know they really speak to sort of like a dreaminess or you, you, does that make sense oh absolutely no i mean i think they they do tap into um you know the the dream state somewhat mm -hmm. um i th i think oftentimes you know i've heard people talk about how when they look at, at that work in particular and i i think the work that followed it there there's there's a bit of that as well how a lot of the images to them are, are these really lovely images but there's there's an underlying tension mm -hmm. to them which which i think is similar to, to in a dream state, you, you, there's occasionally um, a sequence in there where initially it might be somewhat pleasant or you might be in a beautiful place, but there's a sense that something's off kilter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and that's something that I think I've, I've always been interested in, in kind of tapping into. And I, I think I explored quite a bit in the early diffused work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It has such a particular look to it that diffuse quality that you that you just mentioned, and and I think if I recall correctly in your presentation, you said that you did that um, that effect is achieved in, in the enlarger. Yeah, that's all all done in darkroom. So the uh, negatives, I was you know when I shoot film, I shoot everything in focus, mm -hmm. and all the manipulation is done in the enlarging process. Mm -hmm. So that by ha having a sharp negative, it enables me to have really precise control over how much detail I allow to remain in the image, mm -hmm. how much I, I take take out of it. Whereas if I were to throw the enlarger out of focus or shoot the image out of focus, I, I'm limited. Mm -hmm. you know, by, by, by the technical constraints there. Yeah. Um, so I always like to, to work um, with, with a well-focused negative. Mm -hmm. Do you find, I mean, uh, my, my, um, my experience of you from, from talking with you before is, uh, is that, that, um, that, you know, uh, like when you were giving a, um, that uh, presentation at Medium and then later when I, uh, I took a workshop that you spoke at. You seem to have a very methodical and sort of analytical approach to a lot of things. But then this work, um, you know, working in the darkroom where you're doing this technique um, as part of the, um, uh, with the enlarger, it seems like that introduces an element where no two of the prints can ever be exactly the same. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's to me, is very appealing. Because um, I have never wanted to, you know, try and go in and match match prints. You mm -hmm. know, to me that's not interesting. If I'm making an addition, you know, uh, in the darker, I, I want for people to be able to have, you know, a really unique a unique print. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a part of me that's a frustrated painter. Mm -hmm. I've never um, felt like I've had the, you know, the technical skills to, to draw the way I would like to or to paint. Um, and, and working in the darkroom in the manner that I do, that enables me to, you know, to, I, I use brushes in the darkroom. I brush on a lot of chemistry. Mm. Um, so, so that enables me to... Uh, you know, to to get get that little bit out. You know that that part of me that would like to paint but can't. Mm -hmm. um, so I I do enjoy the unique qualities of that, and that's you know something that I find missing now that I'm working the last you know series that I completed and the work that I'm doing now, and I'm shooting digitally and printing digitally, and there there isn't really that unique quality to the prints. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's something that I miss. I'm printing my own work now, which I like, but um, I, I do miss that the kind of hands-on quality of the darkroom mm -hmm. and that ability to let let chance, you know, come into play when you're in the darkroom, when especially brushing on different chemicals. Yeah, and especially with that with that older work, 
you know, that element of chance and sort of surprise, it really speaks to the subject matter, too, with that, that dream state where things can be very chaotic. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. And, I mean, the, just even the, the whole technique was, it was kind of a mistake to begin with. I mean, mm -hmm. it was an accident how I stumbled across that. So that was a really wonderful chance thing. I mean, that, that really, that whole technique just, came without getting into uh, the details of that tech, you know, of the diffusion, because I never really talk about that, but mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was a distraction. I, I was talking on the telephone when I was making a print, which I typically don't do, mm -hmm. and uh, I got distracted, and I screwed up, but it was this really lovely mistake. Mm. I was very happy with it, but then it took me a while to figure out exactly what I had done, mm -hmm. you know, then I had to go back and try and, and retrace my steps and figure out where I screwed up because it was a great screw up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I always find for myself a lot of times um, that those kind of accidental things, things that you just kind of stumble upon, those are really often, uh, you know, where you make your great leaps forward. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in every way. I mean... I mean, you probably know, like, when you go out uh, shooting, if you go out on a road trip shooting, mm -hmm. uh, you miss your exits or you're not paying attention and you go way past where you needed to, you know, veer off onto a different road. Um, it's often those times where you stumble across something that you you weren't at all looking for, but you're presented with this gift. Yeah. I, I find sometimes almost that when I'm when I'm shooting uh with an idea in mind I, I i can almost never actually make any photographs worth looking at um and it's and a lot of times it's only when i'm sort of wandering that um or not paying attention or not really thinking about photographs that the, that those are the times when the good photographs present themselves oh yeah yeah no very much so i i think sometimes um you know, it, it's almost like uh, you know, like you're trying to force something, mm -hmm. and it, it's just ha getting to the point where you have to give up control, mm -hmm. and then it, it it finds you. You know, yeah. sometimes, you know, going out and and seeking something out doesn't work. You sometimes have to let let something reveal its, itself to you more organically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's almost as though you you have to almost let the art be something that flows through you rather than something that you're consciously creating. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you have to be, you have to be ready when, when it presents itself. You know, it, you have to be ready to, to read it properly. It has to make sense. Um, but, but I don't think you can plan everything out, you know, so strategically. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting thing because, you know, everybody has their own way of working. Um, and, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, working artists and writers, um, sort of, I've found that when people talk about their process, many people, um, sort of deprecate the idea of inspiration. And I think there's value to that where, you know, you can't just sort of wait around for inspiration to strike because, inspiration tends to find you when you're working but at the same time you know being able to not over plan things and be able to allow that inspiration to find its way in i mean that seems like the real trick yeah, yeah for sure for sure yeah it's it's uh, it just it just can't be forced mm -hmm. without a doubt mm -hmm. so you mentioned that you're um uh, your more recent work is shooting digitally, and um, that that workshop that I mentioned uh, with Mary Virginia Swanson yeah. was last year, and you were showing um, <clears throat> some of the your early prints, which I think at the time you hadn't you were not doing your own printing. Is that that's correct? Yeah, yeah. I just started a little more than a year ago, so mm -hmm. it was a couple months after. Um, you were out here for the workshop mm -hmm. that, that I started printing myself because um, I, I found that the one thing that was really keeping me from printing mm -hmm. and, and embracing printing was I didn't have um, the, the skill set, you know, to print the way that I wanted to. 
Mm-hmm. So I was, I was working with somebody who's an amazing printer, and he made absolutely gorgeous prints for me. Um, so it wasn't an issue of that I wasn't pleased with the prints, but I was not pleased with the fact that I wasn't producing them myself because mm-hmm. working in the darkroom for so long, that was such a big part of my, my creative process was, was going in and producing the prints myself. So I realized that I had to, to acquire that skill set and I had to take the time to go in and, and really learn digital printing and get to the place where I felt that I could print um, as skillfully digitally as I could in the darkroom. Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't until late last spring that I really had had the time and the, and the funding to really sit down and learn it and experiment, and that I started producing the prints myself. And I went through and, in a few months, printed the entire uh, body of work, which wound up being... You know, there's probably about 70, maybe 80 images, mm. total of which I probably have maybe a 50 to 60 image set that I, I consider uh, as in, in book form, mm-hmm. as the ideal book. Um, but it, it was a revelation to finally see these images um, that I'd been working on for over four years. Mm-hmm. So I started shooting in 2011 and finished in late 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, and to that point had really only had a handful of prints made for me. Yeah, it's such an interesting thing. I I, I know a lot of people that don't, um, you know, that they, they will use other people to, to do their printing. Um, and I've also always found that a little unsatisfying. Um, and as you say, not because the prints come back, you know, looking poor, but just because there's something really satisfying about doing it yourself. There's this quotation, and I can't remember who it who said it, but um, that uh, that the negative is um, the score, and the print is the symphony. Yeah, that's uh, Ansel. Yeah. 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 Um, I always really liked that that uh, that idea. Um, it's a great analogy. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really is perfect. And, and I do feel like that, that, um, you know, I mean, I still think of that more when I think of the darkroom than I do digital, but um, for sure I have a much greater appreciation for digital printing now that I've, I've really immersed myself in it. Mm-hmm. So you, you I, I had only seen a few of these um, prints at the workshop, and then you sent me over... Uh, sort of the full set of them um, uh, last night. This, and I was looking through them and just remembering um, the those. So these images are all um, the series is called the forest. Yes. And then there, these are all images taken in a forest at night. Uh-huh. They're all extremely dark. These seem like they must just be hell to print. They're just there's so much. Um, subtlety in them and getting that out of an inkjet can, especially with where, you know, um, you have a lot of black in them is, uh, it's, it's not easy. (laughs) No, no. I mean, it, and that was, I think what got me interested. I think if I was doing more straightforward images, Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have been challenged by it. Would have been, you know, taking the attitude that fine, I'll let, somebody else print them. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact that there was that challenge to me was engaging mm-hmm. to try and really see how far I could push that and how close I could get to replicating what I would see, you know, when I was out, you know, in the Selkirk forest at night. Um, so uh, the forest is, is, it's in the Colville National Forest. And it's the Selkirk Mountain Range, which is a range that extends from northeastern Washington State into British Columbia. And I think it might go into to parts of uh, northwestern Idaho. Hmm. It's a very dense uh, range, really heavily uh, blanketed forest, um, all pine. And it is very far removed where my where my cabin is, it's about 90, 
some odd miles from the closest city. Mm. And the nearest town is about 30 miles away, and that's only 3,000 people. So it's one of those places that has little to no light pollution. I mean, it's one of those spots that that is nearly devoid of light pollution as well as, as noise pollution. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty magical. So the the whole experience of being out there um, was, you know, you know at, at times it's magical, at times it's a bit frightening uh, because there's no, you know, you're out there by yourself. There's no cell service, uh, anything that goes wrong. You're pretty much on your own. Um, and, and it was one of those fears that I'd had as a kid was this fear of, of getting lost in the woods at night, mm. and just how, how dark it was. So part of it was kind of, you know, uh, examining those fears, facing those fears. That, that's an element kind of underlying it. But I really wanted to try and capture that sensation of how you're out there and when it's a, a moonless night or near moonless night, you know, it's nearly completely black. Mm-hmm. And But after a while, because it's so far removed from any cities, even the starlight begins to illuminate it and your eyes adjust and you start to make out more detail the longer that you do stay out there. So that was a key thing for me was trying to preserve that. Mm-hmm. And so it, it took quite a while, you know, there was a lot of work that went into these, working on the files before printing, and then obviously getting in, running some rough prints, and then seeing what adjustments needed to be made. Yeah, yeah. It it really is an amazing body of work. Um, Well, thank you very much. It's, I, um, I, I, when I was a kid... Um, we lived for a year um, in a cabin in Bixby Canyon in Big Sur, and that's also pretty far from uh, from from the next town. It's not quite mm-hmm. thirty miles, but I think it's about twenty. Um, and um, and even after that, when we moved into town, the town that I grew up in was pretty small, and we lived you know right across um, the Carmel River from the Los Padres National Forest, and. You know, I have all of these really vivid memories of being in the in the woods by myself, usually in the daytime. But you know, at when we lived in that cabin, if you had to go to the bathroom at night, you had to go outside. Um, <laughs> and um, and so I have all of those memories of sort of forest noises and being in the dark with no um, no no human sounds around. There's something about it. And this, I, 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 you know, looking through these photographs, there's the experience of being in a forest by yourself where, um, even in the daytime, um, if you are far enough out, um, where it's simultaneously sort of um, a little bit lonely and a, and a little bit magical and a little bit vulnerable. And that all three of those seem to be really, really nicely encapsulated in these images. Well, thank you. Yeah, vulnerability is, is a perfect, perfect word for that because it's true. I mean, you're out there, you're exposed, you are not necessarily in your natural habitat. You are definitely in the natural habitat of other, other beings. Mm-hmm you know, that are, are much better adapted to, to seeing in the dark, moving in the dark, that know the terrain better. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so there is that. At the same time, having spent so much time at this place, I mean, I've spent nearly every summer of my life up there, so a significant percentage of my life has, has been spent up there. Mm-hmm. Um, there was this sort of innate understanding of the land and a, I, I think, a sense of trust that I wouldn't have if I was going out and, and photographing in a forest that I wasn't as familiar with. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a feeling of familiarity and a feeling of um, um, respect, I want to say, in the photographs. 
Um, and it really, the thing that really, um, that I, that I find myself, um, drawn to is this sort of juxtaposition between, you have these images, like, especially the first one, um, where, uh, where you, you just feel this sort of preternatural calmness to it, stillness that there's such such a beauty in that and you have this feeling like I may be the only person who's ever seen this and there's a, a magic to that mm-hmm. and then at the same time you have images like the one of the I think it's a moose's leg yes that and, is a moose and um, speaks to a certain element of dread when you're out there by yourself um, it, it really sparks a lot of uh, sense memories for me yeah, I mean, there were definitely occasions where I was out shooting and sensed that something wasn't quite right mm-hmm. and that I needed to leave and packed up and, and went, went in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just kind of listened to my instinct. Uh, but, mo- but most nights it, it was a, a pretty calm in- environment. Uh, the moose was was an interesting thing. That was something that uh, you know somebody had seen earlier, told me about. I went out that evening, found it, and it was it was interesting because it it was at a point where I was nearing. Com- I felt like I was nearing completion mm-hmm. of that series. It wound up being the second to last summer that I worked on it. Um, and it, it felt like an image that I had been looking for, not, not necessarily um, a, a, a dead moose, um, per se, but I had been looking for something that definitely spoke, spoke to death. Because mm-hmm. there, one of the underlying elements in this series is, is the life cycle. It's not necessarily about the life cycles, but that is is one element to the narrative. Mm-hmm. So that, that was something that I, I needed to find, but I didn't want um, anything that was quite so in your face as a full-on dead animal. And so look, spending some time and sitting with it, and it was rather an intense experience because it had probably been there a good day at that point, and it had already become... Uh, kind of a vessel for for wasps. It was a summer where I'd never seen such a presence of wasps as I had this summer. Mm. And it, it kind of character, one of the things that I remember about that summer um, was that there was always this electric hum when I went out at night, mm. just about everywhere, that you would hear this humming of these wasps, which was really unusual and I was a couple times stung by a number of wasps. It was a really odd year, but they had started um, kind of almost nesting inside the moose. Mm. It would then get defensive at times when I would come in closer. But as I, as I was really examining it, I noticed the detail of, of the legs. I think it was the rear legs of, of the moose and how they were crossed over and just kind of lying in this, you know, kind of like tall grass and pressing it down. And there was something just very kind of gentle and peaceful about that. Um, that to me was, I realized like, wow, this is exactly what I had been looking for. And I, I made some other images that were uh, a little more explicit mm-hmm. of this, that one of them wound up working its way into a subsequent series. Right. Um, but that, image to me was something I'd never really thought about like how do you make a really uh, a really beautiful image about death something that I think most of us on some level have a sense of dread or fear of you know we probably at some point many of us get to a, a sense of acceptance of that great inevitability but I think in some level we there is a, a sense of fear mm-hmm. of that whether or not we admit it or want to admit it, mm-hmm. but but to be able to capture um, sort of the beauty of that transition to a different state, and thinking about uh, the cycle and and the continuance of life and how um, maybe the body is just a vessel. Yeah, yeah. 
there is a real tenderness to that to that image um even in the suggestion of something a little more grotesque uh, but the the image itself has that that tenderness to it there's a thing now you just said um where you said you were you 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 had felt that you were nearing the end of this project and that is something that i'm always very interested to hear people talk about artists talk about because um it's one of those things i i find varies so much from person to person but how do you how do you know when you're when you're getting to that point yeah that i mean that's a great question because for a while i i thought like well maybe you know you just know when it's over and i think when it came to this project and i felt like i had finished and when I returned to Arizona after a month or two after I returned, there was something that was kind of gnawing at me. And I, I think it was the various transitions that I was going through at the time. So, so much of this work, um, what was about different transitions in my life. And each year there seemed to be something different that, um, was, was kind of a central theme. Mm -hmm. like there was one year where it was the year after my, my youngest daughter Harper had been born. And so a lot of what was going on in my mind at that time were, you know, kind of the new tensions that existed in a, a blended family that had two daughters that were from a previous marriage and then Harper. And so there's a little bit of sibling rivalry at that point. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was less than a year old. And so there was a lot of tension that first year when I started working on it and a lot of the impetus uh, for going out and photographing at night. Um, it was a summer that I was up just with my, my older girls and it was just a need to get away and have some time alone because we all had cabin fever and we're getting on each other's nerves. Mm -hmm. So I started going out on walks each night alone and then eventually started taking my camera with me and then began working on those images later at night. I would always bring my computer up each summer uh, to work on some images. And it, it wound up evolving into realizing that the series had begun. The following year uh, was a year that I was having difficulty with my eyesight and, and wound up having to have eye surgery and wound up going up to shooting when I was advised by my doctors to, to stay in Arizona, go through the surgeries. I was nervous about if something happened and I didn't complete this, so I thought, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to wrap this series up, and then I'll come back for the surgeries. Mm. And my eyesight started degrading as I was, was, was gone. And so I think that whole fear of the unknown, uh, even something that, you know, logically didn't present a great risk. I, I think anybody has a fear if something's wrong with your eyes of losing your sight, but for photographers, that's probably amplified. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that, that was a huge theme in, in the second year. Third year, it was some familial tensions, uh, which carried on into the fourth year, but I, I think that got so amplified after that third year that I realized that there, there was still some work that, that needed to be made. And as I began to explore that in 2014, after I got up there, I, that was confirmed to me. But, I, but I'd been convinced in 2013, one night when I made an image, there's an image of, in there of uh, like a stand of aspen trees. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that one stands out. Uh, but just sort of this glowing bark, and the mm -hmm. rest of the image is pretty much black. Mm -hmm. And I came across that, and at that time, that seemed to me that was the end note. I was like, okay, it's done. And I, I remember coming back to the cabin that night and saying, it's done, it's, you know, and I'd put it to bed, but then realizing that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, th I think coming back and really starting to make just some really rough printouts before I even started printing. I, I think I made like some printouts on the color, color Xerox machine, you know, from digital files and just put them on index cards and shuffled them around and started really playing with the sequence um, in physical form and then realized that, okay, yeah, this, this to me now, 
the narrative feels very complete. I don't feel like there's anything missing. Mm. And that anything that I might come across, I could probably come up with some more great images each year, but um, I don't know that I'd be bringing anything new to it. That's so interesting. It's a, this thing where you just sort of have a feeling that there's something not quite there yet. I find for myself a lot of times when I'm uh, when I've started amassing a body of work that, that the thing that tells me um, that I, I need to start wrapping it up is that I start sort of losing interest in, in, in the subject. Uh -huh. um, and that's sort of my signal to, to say, I think maybe I've taken all the pictures I need to take and now I need to see what, what to do with them. Um, but it's just sort of, you know, one, one approach or somebody else's approach, uh, everybody seems to approach it a, a little bit differently. Yeah, I mean, I, one thing that kind of clues me in is when I, when I feel like I'm repeating myself. Yes. That, that's something that stands out to me and is a pretty good sign that at the, at the very least I need to take a break and step away from it for a while. Mm -hmm. So if I lose interest or, or it's becoming re the images are becoming repetitive, um, I think there's a good possibility that 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 I'm done. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that there were some other images of that moose that made it into a, a later body of work, subsequent body of work, and that is the this this new body of work that I had never seen before, which you very kindly sent me, "Days on the Mountain." And yeah, the, no, very few people have seen this, so you're like one of maybe you know six people or so. I feel very honored uh, oh. that that. Uh, that you were willing to share this with me. Um, it is a fascinating body of work. Um, you sent it to me in the form of book spreads. Yes. Um, so I assume that's that's your plan for it, is to, to make it into a book. Um, but um, it seems like, in a lot of ways, a very different direction for you, not least of which because a bunch of the images are in color. Yes. Um, but I, f I, I found myself really attracted to this work um there's such a strong um thematic element to it um and you know part of this i think maybe has to do with the my own personal interests in photography often have to do with personal stories um and that's how i work myself but so in this series you are you're 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 juxtaposing images um, that really feel taken from your life, little moments here and there, and there are there are these repeated themes of of both you know youth and innocence um, juxtaposed with these images of of mortality, where you, you know like a, a dead wasp, um, a dead moth, the moose, um, and there it it really it really hit on something that. I, th I feel is very similar to, to to some themes that I have been working through for several years in my own work, um, and I'd, I'd really love to hear more about the genesis of this project. Oh yeah, well it's uh, God, it, it's so the work basically um, I began constructing this work. So it's it's work that I shot over a long period of times, mm -hmm. probably. 10, 12 year period of time that this work covers. And there are images that were all made up in the Northwest, that were all made um, up at the cabin, mm -hmm. up in the area where the forest was made. And they illustrate a lot of the, you know, kind of family dramas uh, that, that fed uh, the work that became the forest. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a lot of those you know, kind of little little moments and uh, little family dramas. They, they, you know, those were all captured over the years. Um, and I started assembling this last year. It was around March. And without getting into to too much detail, um, just because it, it's it's kind of a private matter and everything, but it's, you know, it's part of my life, it's part of what informs it. I had, like, this perfect storm in my life that all occurred in about a two, three month period, mm -hmm. um, where my marriage fell apart, uh, one of my children became quite ill, um, 
and everything was just upside down. And one, one of my children was, was hospitalized for quite a while. Mm. Um, and that was this period where I didn't know what to do with myself. I mean, I felt so helpless, scared, unsure. You know, everything felt very unstable at that point. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of like, you know, you have like your two or three big stressors, you know, and it's like they all hit at once. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went, you know, I, I found myself gravitating towards looking at family imagery, trying to kind of make sense of what was, what was happening, what was going on, and just wound up kind of starting to assemble things. And, and you know, narratives started forming and, again, wound up pulling a lot of images that were starting to, you know, kind of create a dialogue mm -hmm. and putting them in Lightroom, shuffling them around, printing them out, you know, on a crappy color copier, again, index cards, and wound up with a stack of about 500 images. And then over the next four or five months, you know, wound up, uh, and, and this was while I was printing the forest as well. So it was this constant thing. I was not sleeping very well. I mean, I went through this period where I, I rarely slept. I mean, it was just working obsessively. Um, but, but wound up shaping it into what I felt was a really tight edit that, that started to make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And I think really started to examine, you know, not only my own sense of mortality, but, but thinking about, you know, my family's sense of, of mortality as well. Um, and, you know, the things that always had kind of taken for granted, Mm. You know, safety, uh, that, that old expression like, well, you've, you've got your health, you know, so everything's okay. But when that, all of a sudden, that's not there, you know, then it's sort of like that, that leg on a chair that, that's been broken off or kicked mm. out. So it was, you know, that's where I think a lot of the, you know, these images of, of death, you know, come in mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, kind of mixed in with this, you know, I don't know if nostalgic imagery, I don't know if nostalgia is the right word, but, you know, certainly not sentimentality, but, you know, kind of going through it and maybe taking inventory on, you know, the times, you know, that were both both really tender and and sweet as well as, as problematic. Mm -hmm. Kind of looking at in the overall arc the overall scope of that period of time. Yeah. Because, I mean, I think as anybody, anybody knows, you know, life is, it, it's, it's not all up, it's not all down. It's, it's very mixed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's that, that word that you used, sentimentality, is one that, um, that has come up a lot, um, um, when I was first starting to get my work reviewed, um, and, uh, you know, at the point at which I probably shouldn't have been getting reviewed just yet, and it wasn't, the work wasn't quite ready for that, but there, that was a word that came up a lot as something to avoid. Um, and I think it's an interesting, I think it's an interesting concept to think about what sentimentality means it's a it's a word that has seems to have a lot of very sort of pejorative connotations especially uh -huh. in the context of art but i think that there is something about there are experiences that we have as humans that 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 are like legitimate and powerful emotions that could be considered sentiment sentimental and I think maybe what the thing that people react to negatively um, and label it sentimentality really has to do more with a sort of saccharine quality that when something is just sugar and no substance, then that there's no depth to it. But rather, you know, there are many moments in this series which have a sweetness to them, but it it's tempered. 
Um, and this is made explicit by, by many of the, the, the facing images, the pairings that you've chosen. But I think, you know, e even without the pairings, uh, that, you know, somebody who has had this experience, that there is a bitterness to that s mixed in with the sweetness because these moments of sweetness are so short-lived. Um, yes. There's an image, I'm looking at it right now, of uh, that really says a lot. It has exactly that in it to me, just by itself. And it's an image of a uh, a, a paw print with some, some looks like dandelions lying next to it. Oh, yeah. And that just so perfectly captures that that idea of um, sweetness but ephemerality to me. Um, and that, that really, to me, that is one of the images that really sort of informs the whole sequence. Um, but, yeah, I really like this a lot. I'm really, oh, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing it with me. Oh, I'm really happy to. That, that image that you mentioned to me is a really key image. I mean, that image was made, it was, I'm, it was either the last night or the second to last night that I photographed for the forest. Mm. And I took one of my children out with me, who's the child that wound up becoming ill. Mm. And it was right around that time that I realized that there was something that was, wasn't right, mm -hmm. you know, that, that there was something wrong with my child. And that image, you know, it, it came at this moment, this revelation that here was this, this image that on first glance, you're like, oh, that's really lovely. But then you're like, kind of terrifying, mm -hmm. you know, because it's clearly a large, I'm not sure what, what the print is. I, I should actually research that. But clearly, you know, there's uh, like two, two types of animal prints, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, one <laughs> that appears to be prey and the other predator. Mm -hmm. um, and these, you know, kind of like almost broken flowers. And it, uh, yeah, it, it wound up being kind of a, a prophetic image of, of just, you know, what was coming, you know, mm -hmm. kind of looming, looming trouble. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I really, I really, this is a, it's a theme that for me, um, sort of, uh, you know, if I have any body of work that anybody knows about, um, uh, it is this this series that I've been working on for several years that has to do with my family. But but that, you know, I uh, for me, for, uh, the way I tend to use photography has to do with really um, um, trying to use the photographs as a way of embodying or or sort of um, depicting um, my emotional state. And that, you know, I use these photographs of my family um, as a way of, of sort of exploring that sort of bittersweetness that comes with knowing that there are these joyful moments of parenthood, that, but that they are going by. Um, so, and I think that, that that experience is something that a lot of artists in a lot of different disciplines have have wrestled with in their work but it's such a universal experience that that it, it sort of remains evergreen mm -hmm. for mm. sure no for sure i mean it's you know i mean yeah like you said there's there's i mean there's any number of people that, that come to mind that have really you know kind of covered this ground but that that come to it very differently mm -hmm. i mean it's everybody's Family is is unique. You know, everybody has this, this very unique life experience. You know that yeah, we we do have these these kind of universal experiences, mm -hmm. and the, this universal lexicon that we can all refer to. Um, but and it, it goes by so fast. And so part of it, I think, was yeah, going through these images. You know, and starting with you know, like one of my daughters now is. Uh, in college, but I, she was probably about six or seven in the the, the earliest images in this series. Mm -hmm. And, you know, seeing her evolve, you know, throughout this mm -hmm. to the point where all of a sudden, you know, she's this, you know, a big sister again to this, this small 
this little small person that you know joined the family mm -hmm. um, is it was, it was really fascinating. And then seeing her, you know, nearing adulthood, you know, towards um, you know some of the later images in mm -hmm. the series, uh, to me, is, was really very revealing. It was it was an incredibly cathartic experience putting this together, and. It was it was something I don't I don't know if I'll ever really release these as prints or not because I really do you know thought you know conceive this as as a book I mm -hmm. conceived this as a book started working on it I never thought about this is going to be a series on the wall it was all about you know crafting a story from these images and so the sequel the sequence in this is is paramount and I yeah. think like what you were saying. Uh, some of these images by themselves without any other context could be saccharine, could be just a sweet image. It, it could be a freaking advertisement uh, for something. It could be a Hallmark card, you know, but... I wouldn't with, necessarily go that far. <laughs> yeah, probably not. That, that probably is a stretch. Uh, but there, there are some that, are, that are, are, are much more tender images than others, but they do get tempered, and I think they are prevented from going into that place of sentimentality by by the images that precede them and that, that follow them. Yeah. I I mean I definitely agree that this you know, I think many of these images would would, you know, work perfectly well on the wall, but that that really the theme the themes, the emotional content, um, really comes out as you say through the sequence of it through the arc of 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 it and it's and it is interesting to me sort of um comparing this to the other uh series of yours that i'm more familiar with that this one seems to have a more obvious narrative to it um i don't know if that's completely completely accurate but uh, you know maybe maybe i'm just uh uh hey. Yeah, no. I mean, I think you're you're on 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 the mark there. I mean, there there are, are narratives to the other series, but they're more oblique. I mm -hmm. think this this is not that it's entirely straightforward, but I think it is more straightforward than the other series. Yeah, I think, um, and it's interesting because, um, like many of your your other bodies of work, are sort of. Um, like in terms of visual style more um i'm not uh, not uniform exactly but like in this this series you know you're you're mixing a, a lot of different sort of feels to the individual images and uh, you know some are some are more uh diffused some are more sharp some are in color some are in black and white that uh they don't have the same sort of unifying visual aesthetic but they still um you know, emotionally, they they hang together in a really powerful way. Thank you. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I expect that it, it it might throw some people. I mean, the few people I, I you know I've shown it to, and mostly people in the curatorial realm, and to to my my you know, I don't know if surprise is the right word, but to to my, um, I was very pleased to see that. What I was trying to get across was was read properly, mm -hmm. um, that it seemed to be working, and that I've had good, you know, really good feedback so far on it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was definitely, um, you know, kind of kind of taking a risk, not only uh, showing some color work, which I, I think is is odd enough. Uh, if anybody knows my work, I don't really have very much color work, even on my Instagram page. Um, but but mixing, yeah, mi mixing color with black and white, mixing, you know, uh, formats, you know, square format, landscape, portrait orientation. It was, uh, it, it was not, it became just a non-issue to me because it was about the dialogue of the images and tr then it was very liberating to get to the point where I wasn't trying to stay with a consistent format, like, mm -hmm. you know, the forest. Uh, is all landscape orientation, the same size, and they're pretty much all black. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the other series are, for most part, they're square format. Uh, so this was really, you know, just 
throwing caution to the wind and um, hoping that it, it, it worked. And, and I, I feel like, like it does. And it also like conceiving something specifically uh, as a book was 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 fascinating to me. Mm. You know, just really focusing on the narrative and the story, and not really thinking about the individual images at all. Mm. You know, with 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 all the other series that I've done, it's been individual images and then assembling it. You know, to create a narrative, whereas this was really just thinking about the narrative mm-hmm. and and piecing it together in that fashion with work that existed, mm-hmm. and not making not making work for the project. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 always exciting to you know when you find a new way of working and it and it clicks. That's that's the best. Oh, so good, <laughs> yeah. so good. I was um, exhilarated when I, when I, you know, kind of finished that. So for the second segment, I always ask um, my guests to, to bring a topic of your own, sort of whatever is on your mind. So what, what's on your mind? Shoo, boy. You know, what, we can talk a little bit about change. You know, I'm always, like, going through changes right now. Um Music, I'm always interested in talking about music and how music, you know, winds up influencing some of the work that I do. I think a lot of other people I know that, that photograph derive inspiration on some level from music. But yeah, like right now I'm, I'm, I have recently sold my house. I'm getting ready to move out of my house and studio and I'm, I'm kind of freaking out about that because that's I've been living here since 98, and then mm. 2000, I built my dark room and studio, and uh, I have this really, like, kind of nice, serene place that's just outside the city limits on, in this area of open desert, and uh, it's kind of weird to be leaving at the same time. It's exciting to be going somewhere different, and I don't know where I'm going yet. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I have an idea. I think I've found, found a place. But, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, kind of not having that sense of stability is at once terrifying and energizing. Yeah, change is, is it, you know, and it's, it's one of those things that, uh, it's one of those things that people say is uh, the only constant in your life that you can always expect things to change. That doesn't necessarily make it any easier when it happens, but it's it's one of those things. I know for myself, uh, I am certainly a creature of habit and um, and routine, and that I have a certain craving for stability. But but that sort of no matter what you do, um, change always sort of finds its way into your life. And and like you say, there is that aspect of the uncertainty being scary, but also exciting if you're open to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it definitely took me a while to get to the point of being open to it. Um, and I think it helped finding a place that looked interesting to me. Mm-hmm. You know, finding this, this development that was being built and being able to um, visualize myself in this place. And it was something I never pictured being in a, in a development like this, but um, it kind of made sense in a lot of ways, and I felt that also that getting, uh, being, being in a place where I was around people more, where right now it's, I lead such a solitary existence to begin with, mm. you know, as, as an artist and spending my days in the studio by myself, but also in an area where I'm kind of removed uh, from people. So the idea of getting uh, more centrally located in the city and being around people, uh, that I'm I'm hoping that maybe that you know maybe sparks some some new ideas. Yeah, I find um, for myself whenever I go through a big period of change, whether it's you know moving to a new city or certainly one of the biggest changes in my life was the birth of each of my children. I have I also have three kids. Um, and, and it usually takes me a long time to sort of get my feet under myself again. Um, 
I, I know, for example, like, um, my kids are all three years apart and it, it, each time that one of them was born, it took me about two years to sort of feel like I was starting to understand the new rhythms of my life. Uh And then of course we immediately turned around and started having another kid. Uh, fortunately, my, my, my youngest is just about to turn two, but we're fortunately, uh, done with that now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah, sort of that experience of, of finding a new rhythm, um, you know, once you arrive at it, um, can feel, uh, sort of like, almost like, you know, what you, you, you can almost forget that you ever weren't in that new place but the the process of getting there can be protracted and 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 very unsettling oh yeah yeah no and it, it's constantly I, I find that it's constantly shifting too because you know it seems like every couple years each of your kids gets to a totally new stage of life mm. and then that i think that rhythm gets thrown you know thrown the wall again you know mm-hmm. it it gets disrupted and then um, I think with, with m- several kids like you have, you're going to have this thing where they're, you're going to have three kids and they're all at very different stages, mm-hmm. you know, a couple different schools and uh, the rhythm really gets, gets thrown off them. <laughs> and it becomes infinitely more challenging, I think, as, as, as a creative person, you know, being able to carve out that time and find that balance between family life and making your own work. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's a huge challenge. Yeah. Um, it's, I'm suddenly in this, this place now where I have more time, you know, with, with, you know, two of my children are older and one's moved out of the house and neither of the two are, you know, with me very often. It's, it's kind of more limited time that they're here. So I'm, Suddenly, in a place where I have more time um, to, to to devote to my work, um, which on one hand is really lovely, at the same time, you know, I, I start to get a little, you know, we'll go back to the sentimental word, you know, start feeling a little sentimental about, you know, my God, this went so fast, mm-hmm. you know, that like Harper, who's five now, it's just like, my God, she's like becoming a big girl all of a sudden. Yeah. You know, and that's where did it, where did the baby go? <laughs> yeah. And and then you see babies out and you're starting to miss it and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift gears before I become like this completely you know <laughs> like overly sentimental person. But no, I mean it's you know it's really being a parent has been really one of the greatest gifts. hmm Yeah, I've certainly found that for myself. Um and it is funny how, you know, I think it's pretty common, especially for, for, for creative people who have younger kids, um, <clears throat> can find themselves, uh, you know, that, that, that I think for almost every type of, uh, maybe performing artists are a little different, but certainly for visual artists and writers that a lot of the work is very solitary and and sort of needs a certain amount of space to breathe and then uh-huh. you get used to working that way and then all of a sudden you you know you have a, a family and you find yourself working sort of catch as catch can and maybe longing for for the old days when when you could spend maybe a, a, a an entire day just working on something but then when you do find yourself with a little more space to breathe, you're you, you maybe hardly even know what to do with yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, but it, it, I mean, I have had over the past year and a half or so, you know, uh, just a lot of time to work, which, you know, it makes blessing, you mm-hmm. know. I mean, it, it's it's great, but it's it also has its drawbacks. Yeah. Um, but... You know, I've, I've got some new work that I've started on recently that that I'm, I'm excited about. Curious to see where it goes. Not uh, still in very, very, very early stage, but yeah. uh, it's uh, you know I think the genesis is there and has built up 
Yeah. So it's kind of curious to see where that goes over maybe the next year or two. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting, you know, I, I, that is sort of one of the things about um, about being an artist that these these changes in, in your personal life so often lead to changes in your work. Um, and, you know, certainly we already, we spoke about how um, the Days on the Mountain book uh, represents a, a pretty big departure from from what you've done before. And I, uh, I can only imagine that that, you know, as you said, had a lot to do with um, with the changes that were going on in your life. As you continue... As as we all continue to move through life and have new experiences, those those all sort of filter into the work in one way or another. Um, it's always one of the things that I find so fascinating about um, being able to look at um, look through an artist's archive and see the progression um, of their work over time and how their their life. Um, and how the changes in their life um, always end up informing the work in new ways. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. When I started thinking about that recently, I was back in Toronto uh, about a month ago or so, and I was had the great fortune of going to an exhibition that was up there that had a photo festival going on, and there was an exhibition called The Outsiders. Mm. That was tremendous. Um, and it had probably eight to ten artists' work from focusing on artists from the 50s through the 70s that were kind of considered outsiders or were working, you know, um, with those that were viewed as outsiders. But focusing on photo and film, so there was... One of the big shows there was, was Diane Arbus, mm -hmm. and it was amazing. I mean, it was it was a huge room in the museum of Arbus's work that must have been forty to fifty prints. Mm -hmm. So, other than the Revelation show that I saw some years back at LA County Museum, this was far and away the largest show of hers that I'd seen. Mm -hmm. Other than that, uh, but but I started looking at this and thinking back on some of the earlier work that I had made and was like, oh, my God, I was, you know, really so clearly influenced by her work um, early on that it was kind of embarrassing thinking about that early work <laughs> that it seemed so obvious to me, at least, and I'm sure to others, you know, I don't really show that work very often, but, um, but that's such an essential part, I think, of beginning to grow as an artist is I think you do have to go through that stage where you are, you know, you know, the point where maybe you go past influence, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's, you know, you know, become a little derivative or what have you to the point then maybe where it gets to, you look at it and you're like, okay, there's an influence there. And then you ultimately, ideally, Find your own, own own voice, and yes, there's there's influence, but that's hopefully not the first thing that comes to mind. Is, is, is what, you know that that deadly question when somebody says, "Oh, do you like such and so and so's work?" You know, and you're like, <laughs> "Oh, okay." <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a, as an educational tool, you know, working through your influences is. I mean, I I think you're right. I think that's 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 a necessary step. And, but it, it's so interesting because that the idea of finding your voice is something that, that every, every artist I've ever heard talk, talks about the importance of finding your own voice. But, but the process by which you do that, by which you acquire a style or a point of view or any of those things with your work, um, is so mysterious you know like there's like that's one of those things that i know i certainly thought a lot about when i was first starting and i would hear you know i'd listen to other people's podcasts and, and hear you know people write in with questions and everybody seems to have this question like how do you develop your own your own voice and and ultimately it's it seems like i don't know if that's a question that can really be answered you know it's yeah i i 
don't know that that, that it is, you know. I mean, I, I think, you know, part of it is is just, you know, um, kind of like a sense of honesty at a point and just, uh, you know, getting to a place where you are working, you know, honestly without regard to, you know, what people are going to think of this work, you know, what, what, uh, you know, what, what box will this fit in? You know, Mm -hmm. how, how is this going to be placed? You know, just, just, just doing, doing the work that comes from an honest place, being true to yourself and let, letting it happen. And it, it starts to feel right mm-hmm. at, at, at a point. I, but yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think you can write an instruction manual on, <laughs> on how to find your own voice. I think it, it's, it's, you just have to get out and have life experiences and be open to new things, take chances fail, not be afraid to fail, not be angry at failing, recognizing that failure is a big part of it. I don't know that you can really succeed if, if you don't have some failures. Yeah, yeah. I think if you're not, if you're not failing, you're not trying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, it, failure indicates that you have, um, you've been trying to reach for something, and if you are never ex- trying to extend your reach, then, you know, you can only be safe and, uh-huh. and, um, and you can never move past your influences at that point. It is interesting because I think especially when, when we're young, we tend to have this feeling like, um, uh, like every, everyone else that we admire is doing such amazing things and, and, you know, how could, how could we ever measure up to that? But then, at some point you have this realization that that no one else has ever had your experiences in life and so no one else could ever actually you know see things exactly the same way that you do and um coming to that realization is i think you know it's a necessary step for any artist but it can be really difficult to get to yeah and and i think also just you know staying open to to what lies ahead and what's in front of you. Mm-hmm. So I know I I used to at times get concerned about trying to make work that would live up to earlier work, mm-hmm. and I kept thinking like, oh god, the first series that I put out, I'm never going to make anything that's as successful as that. Mm-hmm. Um, that that that's as strong as that, and. It wasn't until I could finally let go of that whole notion and not think about that, um, that, that I made work that I felt was stronger than that. Mm-hmm. You know, and just then, you know, being, being open to that idea and, and not, not trying to, to make work with, with the idea that it would reach a certain type of success or this was the, the end goal for it. Just, making the work, making the work that felt right and felt true. Yeah. Yeah. Even that, I mean, it's even when you've been doing it for a while, I, it can be hard to maintain that, that sort of, um, equanimity towards your own work. I know, I mean, even, I remember, I, uh, I think this was last year I read, uh, Sally Mann's autobiography, her, uh, hold still book. Oh, I, I need to read that. I haven't, I haven't read it yet. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, she's an amazing writer. Um, but there is a, you know, one of the things that I found so fascinating in it is to, to see this person who is, you know, rightfully held up as sort of a legendary photographer, um, expressing anxieties and fears about her, her work that, that are exactly the same as, you know, a first year student feels, you know, that there was one point where she, she was talking about, you know, a a period between two bodies of work and, um, and having this anxiety that she always gets where what if she's made all of her good photographs and that there are people, you know, in her life who are friends or family who will just sort of blithely say, oh, whatever, you you always come up with something, you will again. But that it can be hard to trust that when you're in the middle of it. Um, I think, you know, there was so much value for me um, in, 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 in reading or talking to other 
artists and knowing that um, that we all still deal with those same anxieties, you know, throughout our careers. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, there's there's as as much as you know, you tell yourself like, I really don't care, you know, what what anybody thinks. I'm making this for myself. Yeah, ultimately, I'm making work for myself. But yeah, I, I mean, I do care what 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 people think. I do want the work. Uh, not necessarily to be be liked or embraced, although that's that's wonderful. But um, to be to be understood, to to be viewed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I do want there. I do want the work to be seen. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd be lying if if I said I didn't. Um, yeah, ultimately, I think we we make work for ourselves. But uh, if we put it out there, it's there's a reason for that. We do want it to be seen. Yeah. Yeah, I always think sort of liken art in that way to being a conversation where, you know, a conversation uh, really doesn't have, you know, that if you're just talking to yourself, there can be value in that, but that um, it doesn't have the same uh, function or meaning as when you when you say something and someone hears it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh boy. Um well, I think I think that that is maybe not a terrible place to wrap up. Okay. Um I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Oh, thanks. Thanks for thanks for asking me. I really have have enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah, and you know, I have been a big fan of yours for quite some time, so this was a real treat for me. Oh, well, thank you. I you know, really enjoyed meeting you initially out in San Diego and then getting to catch up again last year and look, look forward to continuing the conversation down the road one place or another, yeah. probably Arizona or California. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, Mike. All right. There we are. As I mentioned, you should definitely have a look at Ken's website, which is KenRosenthal.com. You can find a whole bunch of portfolios there, and also he has a number of prints and other items available for purchase there, including the book we talked about, Photographs 2001 to 2009. I have a copy of the softcover version of that book, and I can give it my unqualified recommendation. As you might have caught as well, Ken is on Instagram, and you can follow him there at Ken Rosenthal, one word. He's also on Twitter at Ken Rosenthal with an underscore at the end, and I put links for both of those in the show notes as well. And that about does it for this episode. If you have any questions or comments for me, you can email me at podcast at keepthechannelopen.com. You can also find me in the show on Twitter at channelopenpod or on Facebook at facebook.com slash keepthechannelopen. If you'd like to help out, the best way you can do that is by leaving a review of the show on iTunes. That helps get us included in the rankings so that new listeners can find the show. And if you enjoy the show, you can subscribe via iTunes or Stitcher or your favorite podcast app. Never miss an episode. Our theme music is by Poddington Bear. You can find more of his music available for licensing at soundofpicture.com. Next time, we're going to have our first poetry-oriented conversation. I'll be speaking with poet Hannah Stevenson, so be sure to come back in two weeks for that. And as always, until then, remember, keep the channel open. Uh